This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by the good-looking folks at GoDaddy.com. Use our code Linux and save yourself some cash. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 18, Episode 9. My name is Chris, and joining me on the Skype line there is Alan. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris. Good morning, sir. Welcome back to the program, and yes. a happy Sunday to you. Now, uh, yes. we've got a big show, Alan. Coming up in today's show, we're going to talk about simple file sharing under Linux. I've got a couple of tools that you won't believe how easy it is to share files between yep. machines, and then... Alan and I are going to walk you through Samba, and, but not, not your grandpa's version of Samba. No, 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 sir. No, knock right. it off. No, we're not doing that. No, we're <laughs> going to show you SWAT and why SWAT <clears throat> actually is a pretty good tool for beginners, and it gives you a nice graphical web interface to set up Samba and share all the files you want. Yep. But if that sounds like it's over your head or too confusing, don't worry, because you're not going to believe how dead easy it is to do just some really simple file sharing that works across the Internet or over your LAN. Uh, but yep. also, just before this show started... There was that HTC uh, security story that broke. How about that one? Yeah, it looks massive. And, and now we don't always cover. Yeah, we don't always cover all the Android stuff, but this one's an Android story. We've got to cover. We've also got news about Microsoft and the theoretically exact amount of money they're getting from their little Android endeavors that they're doing, which have expanded. We'll also talk about that. And also, GNOME 3.2 is out this week, and we're going to tell you all about that. And we're even going to bring in Ven from uh, Linux Gamecast to talk a little about the new Frozen Synapse bundle, but. All of that's coming down the road, all down the pipe, because we got, we got a little business to talk to you guys about before we get to all of that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's come up in a lot of different emails to me lately is, why don't you guys drop that season thing, right? You've heard that before, right, Alan? Yep. And we thought, eh, you know, we could take it or leave it. We're, we're, you know, it's part of the show now, and it's, we're kind of used mm -hmm. to it, but we don't have any particular attachment to it. So in the show notes, there's going to be a link for a poll that you can go vote on. And if I check the poll right now as we're streaming this, it's pretty split. About half the audience wants us to drop the season format thing, and about half the audience wants us to keep them. And what I'm referring to is actually going to numbered. So this would actually be Linux Action Show episode 179 instead of season 18, episode 9. Because that's the actual production number is 179. And so then, yeah. you know, we would start this next season. So instead of season 19, we'd come in with episode 181. Mm -hmm. it, uh, for me... It seems kind of like um, a big change for change's sake, but if people find that to be confusing, like if when you first found the Linux Action Show, if, if that season thing threw you off, then it might be worth us making a change just so that we are not off-putting to new viewers. So let us know. Right, Vote but the at poll. the same time, if you're used to watching TV shows, they have the season, so it's, yeah, it kind of makes sense. It right? translate. I figure with it as split as it is, unless there's a pretty major vote that, uh, that makes it slip towards yes, uh, I think we'll just keep the season thing just so, yeah. for historical purposes. But it's in the poll in the show notes. If you uh, would like to vote on that, you can go do so. Now, I've got a pretty great Android pick and also an awesome Linux pick this week. But before we get to that, we should say holler to our good friends over at GoDaddy.com. For sure. Yeah. Now, GoDaddy.com is the world's number one domain name registrar. And you can use our code Linux to save 10% when you check out. But let me tell you something. The nice thing about GoDaddy.com is actually some of the more advanced features that you can kind of get yourself into down the road. For example, all of this stuff that we have for Jupiter Broadcasting, which is a ton of domains, I was able to just give you admin rights over those domains. So right. you can go in there and just do stuff for me now. Right. You can assign account executives to different f uh, subfolders of your yeah. domains. And so you can say, all right, <clears throat> these people have access to these domains and these people have access, or they have read only or write only access. Yeah. Read only like is that. great too, just for like your coworkers and things like that. So if you work at an yeah. organization where you maybe have other people on your team that need to see that stuff. That's yeah, and great. also the ability to move domains between accounts. Uh, yeah. So when our, my partner and I formed our company, we each had a portfolio of domain names. Yeah. And so we created a new account for the company and slid the company domains into one account that we both have account executive over so nice. that we can access it with our regular accounts. That's really cool. And then it's yeah. sort of a shared credential area, where you, but you don't have right. to know each other's passwords. Exactly. That's really cool. And of course, Linux 20 will save you 20% on hosting. So Linux in the uh, checkout box to save 10% and Linux 20 to save 20% off hosting. And thanks to GoDaddy and the beautiful... Danica Kirkpatrick for saying good morning to us over at yes. GoDaddy. And also, they sell uh, SSL certificates. Yes, they do. And they're a good uh, price. And, and the one I have from them is about to expire, so I have to go renew it. Oh, man. Uh, Alan, I forgot to bring my Galaxy Tab in here because this app is so perfect for the Galaxy Tab. Uh, it's good for on a phone, too. It's formatted for a phone, but on a little bit larger screen, 
boy, does this sucker shine. Today. Yeah, I wanted to bring this in to show you guys, but this is called monitor.us. Um, it's M-O-N dot I-T-O-R dot U-S. And it's actually a companion app that goes with the Monitor Us service, which I've probably used for a year or two. Well, as long as they've been around, I've used them. I got in on their early beta. They sent me an invite. But this, huh? this lets you monitor the DNS availability, your web, your ping, port monitoring, all that stuff through their service. And then they send you weekly reports. So I get a weekly report finding out how our different site properties have done and what their percentage of uptime was and all that kind of stuff and charts and their average response time. And now all of that information is going to be available on your Android device using this free app. And the service is free unless you go to some of the more fancier options. So there's really no downside. You get a free app that gives you free stats that lets you know how your site's doing, which is actually really yep. important. The response and speed of yes. your site plays into your SEO ranking. So it's something to keep a track of. Yeah, and especially if you're responsible for a site like that and you're out somewhere and you get a phone call saying the website's not working well, oh, man. You, can, you can pull up this app and you can, because you, you get graphs, you can be like, oh, I see that at this time, all of a sudden it started going wonky. It's like, well, what happens at that time? Or, you know, right. when you call your provider or whatever, you can be like, you know, we've noticed this issue since such and such a time. Well, and this service and will means- monitor things like MySQL too. So like if you have like your websites up, but maybe parts of your sites aren't working. Maybe you're having a database issue, and this will help you kind exactly. of track that stuff down. And, you know, being able to roll, play that back on your Android device, when you're responsible for stuff like that, or if you're just paying a lot of money for services like that and you want to know you're getting what you pay for, stuff like exactly. this is a great little tool. And, of course, when it's free, why the heck not? The monitor, exactly. you don't need the app to use the service. You can, uh, no, you can just, but- if you want to just check it out in the show notes, you can just go use their site. But this app is a nice little uh, addition. And it's well-rated. It's got uh, four and a half stars. So. There you have it. All That's right, definitely Alan. cool. Now check out this universal, this is our new universal pick thing. We're going to either throw in in this slot something like a BSD pick, a web app pick, or a Linux pick. And this week is the Linux picks of all Linux picks. It comes as a recommendation directly from Jupiter Colony in the Linux Action Throw show thread. And it's Bodhi Linux? B-O-D-H-I. You think, you think Bodhi is right? What do you think? Bodhi? Bo- Bodhi? <laughs> Bodhi? Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know, actually, no. Well, it's, uh, it's based on Ubuntu, and it's, this is, uh, the one I'm going to recommend is version 1.20. It's not too old, but here's what they really do that's neat, is they have an Enlightenment environment, a actually really nicely done Enlightenment environment that is not overly packed full of stuff. So like, if you're kind of a minimalist and you know exactly what you want and what you want to use, you can just load just what you need. But in this nice UI, this clean, fresh UI that sits on top of a familiar Ubuntu, the mm-hmm. uh, Jupiter Colony folks are really actually pretty passionate about this it it started with a thread um what was the date on this one back in uh, june actually and i just kind of been watching it to see what people are saying about it and more and more people in the colony have been chiming in saying yeah this is actually a a really great a really great release and so they started throwing in their screenshots of their desktop setup and oh man if you're Mm -hmm. watching the video version right now look how sweet these desktop screenshots look so go check out this thread if you just want to see the screenshots of this distro but this looks like a great os um, so I, that's my recommendation for this week. I, I haven't ran it myself, but when I see this many people in the colony recommending, I feel pretty comfortable saying that it's probably worth the for sure. Linux Action Show's audience attention. There you have it. All right. So go, uh, go vote in that poll. Let us know what you think about the season stuff and go check out all those links in the show notes. But before we go on, I have to give you the runs Linux for this week. Of course, it's tradition here on the Linux Action Show and check this one out. It came from Heather, our, our, uh, friend Mars base in the chat room. And, uh, this is autonomous robot drones. Flock like birds and run Linux. These are Linux powered drones. Now, we covered these when they were in the conceptual state a long time ago. This mm-hmm. is actually them. They're here, they're real now, and well, they run Linux. That's freaky, but also pretty cool. Anyway, great video I have here if you're watching the uh, show notes. It's kind of like the feedback and detail they get. So, these got these little, these little mini Linux controllers on them, and then they sync back to another Linux machine where they get like all of the feedback and, and stuff like that. It's a, it's a pretty intense little uh, process. and of course, they have to use uh, like a web-enabled uh, remote admin kind of setup, which always makes me a little freaky. It's cool. I don't mm-hmm. mind bird-powered Linux machines with remote web admins on them. That's not going to freak me out at all. Of course, they can fly, <laughs> so that's also fine, and they would must have some sort of internet connection if they're running web services. That doesn't freak me out at all. Oh, God. Alan, let's mm-hmm. do the news. Right, Alan. The top okay. story on the news docket for this week. I needed to waken up my face a little bit. I needed to loosen mm-hmm. things up. I thought that was the best way to get that done. I apologize. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Alan, 
We have all kinds of stories. I really struggled to pick the top one, but I wanted to be a good Linux story for the top news, Duncan. Mm -hmm. And that is GNOME 3.2 is released. And uh, sure, 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 there's some GNOME 3 haters out there. I, I uh, was uh, chatting with the live stream before we got started, and the mm -hmm. uh, folks on the live stream said, you know what? It feels like it's in this awkward phase. And I think both Alan and I, used, we still kind of agree with that, don't you? That it's, yeah. GNOME still feels like it's awkward. But, well, you know, they have to keep revving in order to get out of that. So. And they're going in the right direction. So GNOME 3.2 is not only just a bunch of bug fixes, of course, but also some, some new actual decent features. I'll jump to a couple that I think are kind of neat. They have a new web app mode where you can take a web page and make it like, a, like an application, a self-contained app, mm. sort of like Mozilla's Prism or Chrome's web app mode. But now it's yep. going to be sort of built into GNOME. And what's nice about that is I like the idea of taking something like the jblive.tv live stream and making, and making its own that app. an application. Yep. Yeah. So this lets you do stuff like that. Another thing that's kind of uh, nice, other than some uh, UI revamps and stuff like that, is, I'll jump down to it here, right, boom. You see this guy? This is a new Nautilus preview mode that when you highlight a supported file format, like a video or an audio file or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever picture in this case, um, it does a little pop-up preview, sort of like the Mac. It's called um, Quick View on the Mac or Quick Preview, something like that on the uh -huh. Mac. So GNOME has implemented that. It's actually a, a pretty pretty useful productivity tool. I, I actually like being able to flip through well, things. Yeah, pretty especially nice. when you have a lot of files and you're just looking for the right one. Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, also other improvements across the board. Uh, I have a video that you can go check out. It's from uh, Ven, who runs Linux Gamecast. Uh, his, he, he posted a video that he captured and uh, kind of walked through some of the new features, like some of the new Google account support and, and stuff like that. I would say, all in all, this is definitely a step in the right direction. They say they have lots of bug fixes in there, lots of speed improvements. You know, there's still some of the core things that bug me, but more and more, users are getting more and more options to fix those things. So I, I, I'm, I'm actually becoming more open to it. And, and now you can find tutorials on uh, how to get this running on Arch. It's in the extra repo. Or on how to get this running on Ubuntu and OpenSUSE. You know what, folks? If you're interested in a review from the Linux Action Show, just leave a comment over on the show notes for this episode and say, yeah, I'd like a review of GNOME 3.2. Honestly, I'm not sure where you guys stand on this one. Right. I think GNOME might be dead to some people out there. And I think there's maybe some people that are just like, ah, I'll tune back in in a year. But if that's not the case, uh, let us know. If you want to hear, hear our thoughts on this new GNOME, uh, one of the things Alan and I have been discussing off the air is yep. future reviews that we do on the show. If we, if we do them inside a virtual machine, we'll release that virtual machine for download. Right. And so if we want to do that, we want to know what you guys want us to review. Yeah. We'll put a torrent up. We did this for the Arch review that yeah, we did a long time ago. Yeah, the Arch one you did a while ago, yeah. Yeah, so we'll put a torrent up that you could go grab so you could download the review unit that we use during the show. So if we have something set up a way you like, the way you like it or... If you want to know a problem we ran into or whatever it is, at the end of that episode, if you just want to check out what we've been talking about all episode, you'll be able to go grab it. So yeah. I don't know if we'll have that in the first next review we do or if it's going to take us one or two to get it figured out, but that'll be coming soon. So start letting us know what you want to see because you might actually be able to download it, assuming yeah. we get it working, right? <laughs> That's always a challenge. <laughs> we might not be able to get it going. I, I actually tried <laughs> earlier this week to get GNOME 3.2 working before everybody had it out. I tried to go a little more hacky about it, and I mm -hmm. broke my Mint 11 installation. So it's Ouch. possible to still break your machine, yeah. Uh, all right, moving on, Alan, the next story on the news docket is a big one. It's a big one. Yes. A massive security vulnerability found in HTC Android devices, Evo 3D, 4G, the Thunderbolt. Others have uh, been shown to expose your phone number, your GPS location, SMS, emails, addresses, and more for any application that requires the internet security permission, which is pretty much anything. Anything, yeah. And, uh, and like, I, like I said, you know, all that kind of stuff you can get access to, but... It actually gets worse. This is coming from AndroidPolice.com, and this is breaking today. So a lot of the finer details aren't there, but I think right. this is important enough to touch on on the Linux Action Show because For Android sure. is the current blowing up open platform, right? Yep. Open platform. And um, <clears throat> this, one, this one also has... <laughs> all right, get this. Uh, on top of getting all of your things like your location information, your system information... All of your memory, your contacts, your text messages, your build number, your bootloader version, your radio version, the kernel version, your active notifications, the notification bar, uh, deleted right. so SMS like every, text messages. Everything that comes into your phone, basically. On top of that, though, it also looks like there is an APK that comes loaded with HTSense called HTCloggers.apk. And this HTCloggers.apk is actually a keylogger that accepts various types of commands. 
and no login or password are required to access, access right. the interface. Right, so this is a, basically a logging framework that logs everything you do on the phone and then accepts commands that reveal that information. The problem is the interface that accepts those commands is not secured in any way. Right, and it includes the ability to execute a VNC server, which is also yep. built in. So you can yep. actually see someone's screen. Right, and I can understand this be a handy development slash debugging tool, although I don't know why it would be deployed in production on everybody's phone. Uh, but at the same time, you, you need to have security on these interfaces. And honestly, the user should have a way to have to opt in oh, to having this right? information collected. Um, Android police went ahead and notified HTC of this five days ago, and then because HTC hasn't responded within five days, they have a disclosure policy where they then release the information to the public, and so they've because done that. a lot of times, otherwise the company will just ignore you. Right. They've we've also, talked about this uh, before on TechSnap, it's just like, a lot of these companies, you know, especially big corporations, they don't have, or don't, you know, publish a, a specific person that you should report things like this to. <coughs> It's like they should have an information security officer or something whose job it is to receive these right. types of vulnerability announcements because... A who's accountable. Yeah, because you go to their website and they have like, you know, most of the times they don't even have a contact form on a big website like HTC, right? Because you don't normally buy directly from them. You would buy from your cell phone company or whatever. And so you, there's no way to get a hold of them to tell them, hey, there's this important vulnerability you need to be aware of. I know. And so it's just some of these things, no matter how bad they are, they just sit. Now, Android police uh, worked with a uh, security expert called Trev E, and he actually created proof-of-concept apps to actually go ahead and yeah. exploit these vulnerabilities. Yes, they actually exist, and they've been able to build apps to take advantage of them. Right, and uh, he was... He's done stuff for Android before. Yeah. At the top of the article mentions what he did before. I forget yeah, what it is. Yeah, and they've confirmed that it affects, like I said, the Evo line and the Evo uh, and the MyTouch, and uh, also... It seems like it could very likely affect anything that utilizes HTC Sense. Yeah, anything that, that where they're going to push this software update. This really feels like the ultimate bastardization of an open platform. Yep. Where, where vendor lockdown goes amok, and you take something that was created, and you just bastardize it, and you, you actually harm the consumer. Mm-hmm. This is what is such a shame that Mego has been a failed start. And it goes beyond Mego at this point, because... The LIMO Foundation and all of these people were around and established before Android or just when Android was announced, right around that same time period. Yep. Now, they haven't had the financial backing of Google, but it is such a failing now at this point that we haven't been able to deliver a platform that is an alternative to Android because Android is quickly becoming our worst enemy. Mm -hmm. It's becoming, they take our, our own code and they turn it against the community. It, Honestly, the only viable response, in my opinion, to this, what HTC did, is A, vote with your wallet, and then B, root your device and wipe it and put Cyanogen on there or something. You know, don't go with the stock ROM. This is once again why we as the consumer, out of the box, should have administrative rights over our own phones, over our own computers we're buying. Yes. Every device. We're getting these devices now that are full-blown computers that can spy on us like any PC can spy on us, and we mm -hmm. don't even have the admin password. How stupid yeah. is that? How dumb and are we for buying that with, stuff? With laws like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and the one they're trying to pass in Canada now that is very similar, they're, you know, if there's any kind of digital lock on it and you circumvent that, for example, to protect your privacy, uh, it's breaking law, and that's ridiculous. Yeah, I, it seems like the only, the only proper response to this would be to give the power to the consumer to allow them to just remove this from their devices themselves. Yep. You know, they need to push out an update that gives everybody a settings option where you click it and you're rooted and then mm -hmm. let you wipe the phone because you need to go with a alternative third party ROM at this point. You know, as a, and I say that as an Android user of several years now, there is never as good of an experience as an alternative ROM. And it's, it doesn't matter how great your phone is. It doesn't matter how great the bundle utilities are. That third party ROM always runs better always runs faster, and now in this case, apparently, doesn't have these incredible, incredible vulnerabilities. Again, the VNC server and the ability to remotely connect and have a keylogger and all that stuff is just the tip of the iceberg because mm -hmm. they have a vulnerability that makes any application from anywhere on the planet able to read all of that other information, not just HTC. So on top right. of spying on you, they've also made you incredibly vulnerable, and the Android market is well known now for having malware issues. It's just, it's mm -hmm. unfathomable. And they are, a, they are one of the number one Android vendors. It is a complete stab in the back of the consumer. It is. I hope, I hope 
that HCC comes out and has a fantastic explanation for this. Because it, it, it's Sunday morning, and maybe they're just having themselves a nice lazy Sunday. You know what? Everybody likes cupcakes and going to the movies. Maybe they're just chilling. And maybe when they get back on Monday, they're going to sit down, and they're going to go, oh, holy crap, on Twitter. And they're going to be like, dude, our bads, we're going to push out an update. Look for it in the next couple of days. Because I think that's the only sane response they can have here. Yeah, but at the same time, it's maybe too little too late. Yeah, I agree. Just like they should have thought of this before. Like who just leaves stuff with wide open interfaces on it and pushes it out to everybody's phone? What the hell is Android's problem? I mean, do you remember when the G1 shipped? It had the terminal open in the background logged in as root. So if you actually typed the words reboot on your phone, it would actually reboot the phone because everything you typed is being mirrored into a terminal in the background as root. <laughs> Get your act together, guys. I mean, what the hell? No wonder why Apple still has 40% of the market share. I mean, mm. this is stupid. And it's so frustrating to see me go. This is, really the, this is really what's got me upset, is because we can't come to the table with our own solution. We just can't get it up. The, the community is impotent in this area, and we're being ran over by these greedy bastards out there. And yeah. w- with our own code on top of it. I know I'm going in circles here. It's just right, so but- damn frustrating. And I'm an Android fan, and th- I'm still pissed. Just saying. I'm just saying. Yeah. And, and, you know, in a lot of ways, it's the best platform out there. And it has a lot of issues that, why aren't we trying to solve these? Fundamental that, yeah, exactly. It could be one of the best platforms out there. And with the move to support x86 and the rumors of Android-based desktops and laptops coming out, it's now is the time to get a handle on this before we have a worse issue than we had with Windows with Linux code. It seems like we're going that direction. All right, let's move on to some positive news, some good Linux news. I've got the chat room all riled up here. We do this live at jblive.tv on 10 a.m. on Sundays, except for next week. Next week, we're shooting Thursday after TechSnap. Um, I even, I even wrote down the time. Because of Canadian Thanksgiving. Yeah, you know, I, I should warn people, that kind of comes up, Alan, in, in, around November and October and December. Mm-hmm. It's holiday time. But, uh, you know, we're, instead, of taking, instead of not doing a show, we're just going to do the show early. That's mm-hmm. kind of the two options is no show or an earlier show. So uh, if you want to watch live, tune in at jblive.tv at 2.30 a.m., 2.30 p.m. Pacific on Thursday. That's 5.30 Eastern or 9.30 p.m. UTC on Thursday, October 6th, if you want to watch live. All right, Alan, let's move on to the next news story because it's a good one. And it's a positive yep. one for a Linux vendor, and I like that. And that is Red Hat. Red Hat is on track to be the first billion-dollar open-source software vendor. One billion dollar vendor. Uh, They're not there yet. Uh, Some of the news sites out there are actually reporting that Red Hat is there already. It's actually a little different. Uh, Red Hat... The projection for this year will put... At the end of this fiscal year, which will actually be next year, uh, they will break the $1 billion mark. Yeah, and it's looking good for them. I mean, revenue this quarter is up 28% year over year. They've got new customers. Existing customers are resubbing to the Red Hat update service. And uh, they're on track to finish fiscal 2012 as a billion dollar company. Yeah, and it's, I think part of that at the same time is that with virtualization taking off, you just more licenses, like more uh, imp- servers. Not necessarily physical servers, but the, just the density is higher because, you know, one physical server could be running like four copies of Red Hat Enterprise Linux in mm-hmm. virtualization. And they all need updates and they all need that update service. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah exactly. It's just more sub revenue for Red Hat. And you know what? what? It's like what? I mean, for the good stuff, it's like, Two grand a year, I don't remember. Two, three I, grand I don't a year yeah, for the really like good stuff. And you know what? If you're a Fortune 500 company with super critical servers, you do not care about spending that money. That is okay not at with all. you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Next story on the news docket is a face palmer. And that was me face palming for you audio listeners. Um, I had a little bit of a sweaty palm too, so now, uh, yuck. <laughs> Anyways, Nokia just, I, I just, I want to sit down with Nokia, give them a beer, and just put my hand on their shoulders and be like, Nokia. What are you doing here? What are you doing? Nokia mm-hmm. announced a new low-end Linux for their cheap smartphones. This is uh, <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, Linux, uh, a Linux-based OS named Meltemy. Melt my brain, more like it. The phones are expected to cost under $100 without subsidies. And there's no comment on uh, the de- timelines and all that stuff. But uh, can you just, after the people who essentially put the final bullet in Migo's head, join ranks with Microsoft and are jettisoning Symbian to hear them announce that they're launching another Linux phone? Yep. Screw these guys, Alan. Screw right, well, these guys. You know what yes. I'm saying? Like, oh, well, I, part oh. of it is this isn't a smartphone, right? It's their low-end phone, so it will be like calls I and text care. messages only with you know no what? apps. Screw them. But Screw yeah, them. It's like, 
couldn't they have just done a stripped down version of Mego and kept yes. it alive or something? Because you know what like, Mego was? Linux. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Well, maybe this next story will put me in a uh, it put me in a better mood because I am so dumbfounded by this, and we haven't even gotten to the Mego news yet. Uh, yep. But first, we have to talk about the boys over at Microsoft. You might be familiar with them. Uh, Tony Soprano, I mean, uh, Steve Ballmer uh, runs there, and uh, he, of course, made a visit to Samsung this week to celebrate Samsung signing a patent licensing deal with them. <laughs> Isn't that yeah. great? And uh, <clears throat> Goldman has chimed in over at BusinessInsider.com with a, annual, with a projection of how much money Microsoft makes off Android now, and they believe it's up to $444 million from patent licenses. Yep. So it's pretty clear now that Microsoft makes way more money from Android than they actually make from Windows Mobile, or the Zoom, yep. or probably the Xbox. And almost probably as much as anybody else tries to make off Android. <laughs> um, it's kind of interesting that it's entirely possible that Microsoft is the biggest winner in the, the fact that Android is taking off. And you know, we, we really have to find out is, of course, what that patent is. And of course, Microsoft's not going to share it. But you know, yeah. word was they were going to go after Motorola mo Mobility as well before Google came in and, and bought them. Exactly. And now that deal might be being placed on hold by the U.S. government, which might, I don't know where that leaves these patent lawsuits now. Yeah. So, boy, oh boy, is it just raining for Android. Mm -hmm. and it, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's also, at the same time, a testament to how huge it is that it's actually resisting and being resilient to all of this? I mean, think yep. about that, right? Think about the fact that it's still as big of a force as it is in despite of all of this. Right, well, there aren't many other options, right? Like, Apple isn't offering iOS to any other handset developer, and if the only other option is uh, Windows Phone 7, then... <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you're right, you're right. It's just, that's why I'm pissed that Mego hasn't made it. Now, uh... Yep. Of course, uh, just as a follow-up story while we're talking about Microsoft, you remember that whole hoopla about uh, what's still going on, about Windows 8 and their new secured boot environment that could potentially lock and keep Linux off of a desktop? Mm -hmm. Microsoft has issued a statement about that, so I thought we'd give a little follow-up to that. And, man, it's one of these statements that reminds me uh, why I want to kick these guys in the nuts so hard. Boy, I'm fired up today. I apologize, everybody. It says, That's a few days ago... Good. No, I mean, this is just maddening. A few days ago, a Red Hat employee, Matthew Garrett, which we read his blog post on the show, speculated that OEM machines shipped with copies of Windows 8 may lock out support for Linux installations. Garrett highlighted Microsoft's new, new secure build OEM requirements for Windows 8 systems. Microsoft chose to directly respond to the confusion surrounding Windows 8 use of UEFI secure boot feature on Thursday. Tony from Microsoft said, Microsoft supports OEMs having the flexibility to decide who manages security credentials and how to allow customers to import and manage those certificates and manage secure boot. We believe it's important to support our flexibility and to support the OEMs to allow our customers to decide how they want to manage their systems. Right. So what Microsoft's saying is, and what we were saying when we read the story was that Windows won't get to decide. Uh, it'll be up to the device manufacturer to decide who gets the keys to be able mm -hmm. to update their UEFI. I, my, my personal favorite line, though, is this little double talk they do here at the end. Yes. We believe it is important to support this flexibility to the OEMs and allow our customers to decide how they want to manage their systems. Right. Because we are and not the customers. Case, yes. The OEMs the are the customers. not the customer. The OEM is. Yeah. Exactly. So Microsoft's saying, go screw yourself. There. It's up to our OEMs. We're just right. making the platform for them. Right. But at the same time, you know, they may have deals like they've had before uh, with the OEMs where it's like, yeah, if you let people have the key and be able to not install something other than Windows, we're not going to give you $40 off your Windows license. Right. Or something like that. Oh, you know what, Alan? Mm. I think I need to take a few deep breaths and talk about some gaming. And uh, the new, uh, hun the, actually, the Humble Frozen Synapse bundle is out. And I brought on Ven from Linux Gaming Cast to talk about it. So let's talk to Ven. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Good, though. Thanks for joining me, sir. And uh, you mind uh, telling us a little bit about what the Frozen Synapse bundle is? It's different than the past bundles that we've covered on the Linux Action Show. And since yeah, it's, it's new, I thought, what a great opportunity to have somebody who's really following it tell us all about it. Yeah, I think this is the first time we have ever had a humble bundle that wasn't necessarily a bundle. Right. This came up with just frozen synapse. Now, trauma has been added to the package. And, now, if and, and that was a, based on, like, un, they, people unlocked it, essentially? Um, what do you mean by that? Like, but people bought enough that it unlocked a next game? Is that why it's not a bundle anymore? Because you only get one game until a certain dollar amount is spent? Well, the way it's laid out is, if you go over the 
minimum donation, which is $4.65. Ah, okay. You unlock the previous Frozen Bite bundle. But as a bonus, they've added trauma to the Frozen Synapse bundle. So it is technically a bundle now. Now, you've actually gotten to uh, do a little uh, game review on uh, Frozen Synapse, right? Yeah, I've taken a quick look at it. It is a, you know, I'm not a fan of turn-based strategy games. Okay. I am now. Oh, really? Simple as that. Um, this game has all the makings of a time vampire. <laughs> oh, really? You really got sucked into it, huh? Well, I, I've kind of kept it a leash. I'm going to leave the multiplayer for the holidays. <laughs> oh, it's got a multiplayer mode, too. Now, this is oh, new right. to Linux, right? Didn't they port it to Linux for this? Is right, this is the first um, appearance of Frozen Synapse on Linux. Yeah. So, so that's kind of a secondary it, perk of these uh, Humble Indie Bundles, is they also make the developer make a release for Linux as well. That's right, and that's something I really liked. Uh, but with the multiplayer, and this is what I'm kind of shying away from, you set up your waypoints, and it's tactical strategy. You do your time, you're aiming, and you hit play on both sides, and the scenario plays itself out. Oh, that's great. I love that and kind of stuff. So you sit yeah. back and you plan your attack. It's, it's a game of chess. Yeah, exactly. Maybe that's wow. what they will really be playing in Star Trek in the future. They'll be playing Frozen Synapse and not three-dimensional chess. I agree, I agree. So, Ven, is there anything you think we should know about this uh, bundle before we uh, wrap up here? I don't know. Um, definitely pick it up. We only have about seven hours left. Oh, man. On the end, and if you do, pay more than 465 you're going to get all of the Frozen Byte bundle, which is Trine, Shadowground, Shadowground Survivor, and a really neat demo they worked on and never released called Jack Claw. Awesome. So, awesome. worth checking out. So, uh, where can the uh, Linux Action Show viewers go check out more of your videos and stuff? Um, you can find us on YouTube at Linux Gamecast or just linuxgamecast.com. Very nice. Thank you, sir. Thanks for coming on the show and chatting with, this, uh, with me. We'll talk to you Thanks. soon, okay? And keep up the good work. I love the site. All right, Alan, let's move on with the news docket, because the next story on the news docket is all about Mego. And uh, Mego has officially seen the last of its days here on Earth. Very sad. It's very sad, actually. But, but perhaps, you know, Alan, when open source closes a door, open source often opens a window. <laughs> That or a garage it? door. Yeah, or a garage door. A bigger door <laughs> instead of a smaller one. <laughs> yeah, totally. And uh, so this is a new effort now that's going to be launched by the Linux Foundation and the LIMO Foundation, which, honestly, I'm kind of really digging that. That's the most exciting part about this. But they're announcing the launch of a new platform. And boy, am I going to attempt to pronounce it. It's called Tizden, or Tizen, T-I-Z-E-N. Tizen, something like that. Tizen, something like that. Uh, and it's not going to exactly use Mego, but they say it might be based on Mego. Here, I'll read you a few choice quotes that I found in the article that I think the peeps at home might like. It, and it, it, the, uh, this was uh, around a question about, why not just extend Mego? Why are you killing it? Why? And I don't think they really answered, but here's their official response to why not just continue Mego. Uh, he says, we believe the future belongs to HTML5-based applications outside a relatively small percentage of apps and we firmly convince that our investment needs to shift towards HTML5. Shifting to HTML5 doesn't mean slapping a web runtime on an existing Linux, or even one aimed at mobile, as Mego has been. One of the next, over the next couple of months, we will be working very hard to make sure that users of Mego can easily transition to Tizen. Sounds like WebOS. Maybe. Right? Maybe. And here's the thing. I honestly think they're just trying to get the stink of Mego off them. I think Mego's seen as a failure in the industry now. Yep. And I think they just want to get the stink off. They're changing partners. Another interesting bit, they're bringing Samsung in. Mm -hmm. And so you, you're introducing Samsung, who has been worked on, on their version of Linux, but maybe this will sort of replace that. Uh, they yeah. also have Android. They also have Windows Phone 7. Yeah, and now they're they going to have this. Yeah, and they, you know, we just talked about them having the, paying all this money to be able to keep doing... Right. Android, but I guess that money is Linux patent, so that would apply to this as well, not just Android. Yeah, true. And I think, you know, they might use it as sort of like Nokia's rolling their new OS for, as like a lower feature phone OS. But mm -hmm. I, I honestly have nothing but respect for the Linux Foundation. And yep. while the LIMO Foundation, I don't really know much about, I do know that the companies that make up the LIMO Foundation have very, very important patents in the telecommunications industry. So they're good partners to have, too. So... This, you know, honestly, I never was really all that comfortable with Intel being the big person behind it because Intel's a chip company. They're mm -hmm. not a software company where, you know, the Linux Foundation and LIMO, 
they work a lot in that world. They live in that right. software world. So this could be a good thing. But yeah. you got you to gotta agree with me. It's too little too late, it feels like. Probably. Yeah. What, what chance can it have? Yeah. Like, <laughs> if they want to you know, start taking market share away from Android, they need to be at the level Android is yesterday. Yeah, and that means an By ecosystem. By the time they catch of, up, we're going to have, you know, like we were saying, Android on the desktop and Android on everything. Mm -hmm. And by then, it's going to be awfully hard to unseat them. And, and, and it's not just the apps, but the apps are huge. And there are apps like yep. Netflix and there are apps like, you know, all that kind of stuff. But it's also a music store. It's videos. Mm -hmm. It's all that stuff. It's the, the whole ecosystem that yeah. just... It so, takes a long time to build, and it's hard to get people to switch. And if, if, I'm a, if, I'm, if I'm a phone manufacturer, and I go with Tizen, then I still have to come up with all of that back-end stuff. How are people going to sync their email? How are people going to sync their calendars? i gotta, mm -hmm. I got to invent all of that stuff. If I use Android, I get, and, I, and I sign the deal with Google, I get all of the Google stuff. I get the Google yep. backup services. I get the Gmail. I get the market. People can buy movies from Google. They get the Google checkout. I mean, how do you compete against that? Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see where it goes. Uh, and it's, it's something, of course, we'll follow here on the show because I honestly want to see this succeed. I'm, I'm, those are my concerns. That doesn't mean that I'm casting complete doubt on it. I think it's, if it, anybody could have this project right now, it's in the right hands. Mm -hmm. So we'll see where it goes. I'd love to see, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see a, 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 they, a little more focus. You know, they're yeah. talking smart TVs. They're talking tablets. They're talking phones. N that is so diverse that that's not, Generally, one UI to rule them all, and not one ecosystem right. to rule them all. And spreading yeah, it out like that from the very get go. Yeah. yeah, you end up with a bad experience on every device, uh, or a mediocre experience on every device. Instead of focusing on, let's make it work really well on a phone, and then we'll worry about everything else after. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, why don't we talk a little bit about the Libre Office project, and then we've got an interesting little thing that Alan and I have sort of dug up here but the libre office uh just a quick check-in we're now at the uh, one year mark of the fork from open office and mm -hmm. how are things doing you might ask well ars technica has a great write-up on the state of libre office and here's a couple of tidbits that they said libre office has accumulated twenty-five thousand code commits since the fork mm -hmm. uh, these are commits made by a diverse body of 330 separate contributors it has 136 official members of the project uh, and, and recognized by the community it's also uh, got uh, 15,000 subscribers on their mailing list. But here's an interesting little bit of information on the OS usage. LibreOffice has seen particularly broad adoption on the Linux operating system, which accounts for 15 million users of, open, or of LibreOffice. Of right, LibreOffice's... Go ahead. That's some distributions include LibreOffice. Well, I think most right? now include it by yeah. default, yeah. And that was a huge boon for them. It was, yep. it was actually it was a great example of how the open source community can take an open source project and work together to prop each other up and make each other better. Yep. Uh, of LibreOffice's 10 million users, wow, 10 million users outside of the 15 million that use, uh, use it on Linux, of the other 10 million users, 90% use Windows and 5% use Mac OS X. Uh, counting yep. all of LibreOffice's downloads from the mirrors, the download exceeds 22 million users of LibreOffice. It's a pretty good success for one year. 22 so. million? Boy, I'd be ecstatic if, the, if an episode of Linux actually still got 22 million downloads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, grats to them. Uh, you know, I didn't realize how much of the LibreOffice drew in from uh, Novell's uh, fork of, of OpenOffice. But I guess, they, I guess when they started, they brought a lot of that in. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, um, well, because Novell does uh, OpenSUSE, right? Yeah, and they have, they have their, their take on it. Now, this next thing we're going to talk about isn't really a news story as so much as an no, observation. It's, uh, Right? Yeah, it's just a, a, you know, look at the meta world of Linux. That's a good example, because when you think of Linux, at least some of the of us older Linux heads, we think of it as the world is derived from Red Hat and Debian, and then there's Slackware. Yeah. And that's the entire world. But in my view, Red Hat's the big dog in all of that. And now yeah. we're looking at some of this information here. Over the years, that's transitioned quite a bit, hasn't it? Yeah, well, we just see that, you know, Red Hat is going very strong and is on track to make a billion dollars. Uh, but at, at the same time, their uh, they were share like the genesis of, of the uh, genesis yeah. uh, is, is shrinking. Yeah, so this is an you know, that, At the same time, that could be uh, just more focus and less forking. The uh, chat room was asking me, I'm showing the video version, I'm showing a chart of the different distro branches, and they're saying, Chris, zoom out of the chart. You guys, 
I am way zoomed out. This is a yeah. big chart. I'll have a link in the this show notes for this giant thing. Uh, SVG that you would just have to look at for yourself. But to here's what's understand. fascinating: is it starts it starts at 1992 and goes to 2011, and the chart seems to indicate that you can see this massive branch off of Debian. I mean, just fundamentally, Debian was the seed for so many distros. Yep. But wow, when Ubuntu and then hits, one of those was Ubuntu, and it itself is branched off. Just as much. Yeah, Ubuntu looks like Ubuntu has as many branches off of it as as, as Red Hat does total. Uh, as Red Hat, sorry, the number of branches of Ubuntu that are active as of 2011 is 42, or approximately 42. Okay. Uh, and the total branches off Red Hat that are active in 2011 is about 46. Oh, okay, so, so it's yeah, still so got a few more. Now, Red Hat used to have a lot more, but a lot of them have, have disappeared over the ages. As a lot of Slackware ones have as well. Yes, a lot of the Slackware ones have uh, yeah. dried up. Yeah, we're looking at the Slackware chart right here. Now, the, the thing that's interesting is the time difference between Ubuntu and Red Hat. Do you think that this is Ubuntu, or do you think this is apt that it, actually propelled Ubuntu? A, a lot of it, I think, is uh, that uh, Red Hat's RPM package system has is just, you know, not endearing to people. Well, especially when these branches started. I mean, this, a lot of these, if you look at the timeline, a lot of these branches, Yum wasn't a really fleshed out tool yet. Right. So a lot and of these people did this when Yum wasn't a great option, and now they've, now they've made that choice. So packages on Red Hat were a giant problem. And so by using Debian as the base, and you got this package uh, system that actually worked, and it, you know, it but caused more of that to happen. It sort of shows you the circle of, of Linux life, though, because we're talking about how all of these are really derivatives of each other, right? Yep. And Red Hat, and then we mentioned, you know, Red Hat really saw, uh, you know, Red Hat kind of was maybe stunted its growth by RPM, and they needed something like Yum. And Yum wasn't actually even Red Hat's original creation. You reminded right. me of this, actually. Yeah, that's originally from the Yellow Dog Linux, right? Yellow Dog, which was that PowerPC distro. And they took the Yellow Dog Update Manager, Yum, yep. moved it over to Red Hat, and sort of fixed up Red Hat's whole RPM situation. And I wonder if Red Hat was in the position they're in now, especially now that they've also, they have that Fedora Spins tool where it's really easy to make derivatives and stuff. I wonder if they were in that same position if they wouldn't see a massive expansion, sort of like Ubuntu did back a couple of years Possibly. ago. But at the same time, I think Red Hat saw a lot of its forks when it was uh, less commercial. Uh, and now that it's more commercial, it's a lot more focused. True, true, yeah. It, it, definitely, it definitely does, yeah. Hmm, that's an interesting observation as well. I wonder if people got afraid of it or what? Well, I think also just uh, the project is, because it's more corporate and more organized. It's more focused that way. It's more corporate right. focused, uh, too. There, there's less policy disputes that result in forks. Right? Like a lot right. of the reasons for a fork is because you want to go a different direction than the other people. Right. And so you create a fork. Right. And then you do that 108 times over or whatever. <laughs> so what you're and, also saying and, is maybe well, all these forks is an indication of a little bit of uh, internal mess. Yeah. Well, it's like you, you see a lot of the forks that that's go off and then shortly die. Yeah. And you know, uh, uh, that one obviously didn't get any traction. Right. But in the end, it, I think it's part of the, the issue that Linux has to deal with is the fact that it's, there's so many of these distributions. Now, some of them aren't different enough to where you know, an app would work on one and not the other. True. And, yeah. and also, there's, and there's, another, there's a flip side to the Linux position. Yeah, there's a lot of diversity there, but we have the exact opposite problem that the Android camp has right now. Is, right. You know, it's so diverse that if one vendor just is a... Like if Ubuntu turned in... If, if all that stuff that came out about HTC today came out about Canonical, mm -hmm. I would never run Ubuntu again, and that really right. wouldn't fundamentally alter what I have to do in a day. You know what I mean? Whereas that choice gives me that power. Right, although Ubuntu is one of the more supported options for a lot of apps yeah. and so on. Yeah, that's true, yeah. But you know and what I'm so saying. It, so there's, there's advantages and problem, disadvantages. Yeah, there's advantages and disadvantages. <clears throat> uh, and, you know, because it's open source, it's a little different, right? Like, mm -hmm. that couldn't really happen, right. per se. Right, yep, yep. Somebody would make a fork of Ubuntu with all the crapware removed. So we have, in the show notes here, uh, we have uh, some points. Everybody ought to take a drink every time I say that. I'm going to stop trying to say that, but... There's just a lot of good little notes in here about this, including a link to this massive chart. This, yes. is, this is a real beauty of this SVG. It's, and I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm a big geek when I say that, but I really mean it's, it's a beautiful chart. Like, you can zoom yep. in, and it, it just scales so nice. Yeah, <laughs> I love that SVG, is, man. Yes. Uh, and on, Ubuntu, or sorry, on uh, Wikipedia, they also have one that shows uh, 
the origins of like all operating systems. Yeah. Going back and like looking at how AT and T Unix eventually, yeah. you know, went through all the parts that were BSD and where the lawsuits happened and how the rewrites happened and you know how BSD happens, but also Linux and Mac and Sun and all yeah, the different. Grab yourself systems. a beer, have yourself a toke, and go read that one because it is really fascinating. But it's a deep dive. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, Alan. Well, that's all the news for this week. All right, Alan, let's talk a little about file sharing under Linux. There's a lot of different ways you can do this, but we want to keep it kind of simple. And Also, we kind of have like persistent sharing on the brain, but there's a few right. quick and dirty options. Do you want to talk about maybe SCP, Alan? Right. So if you just want to copy one or two files from one computer to another, then if, if you have SSH set up on the one on one of them, you can use SCP or SFTP to copy the files. And that's nice because that runs over SSH, so you know it's nice yeah. and encrypted. It's secure, and it uses the username and password you already have set up. And you probably and, likely already have SSH installed, so there's nothing extra yeah, to install. Yeah, and there's really nothing to configure. It works out of the box. So, so check just, out SCP if you want yeah, to just so, do a quick Yeah, uh, so SCP is basically, it's just the copy command tunneled over SSH. So the command line parameters are the same as if you were just copying a file with CP, except for on either the source or the destination file, you put username, at yeah. server, colon, and then the path. It's awesomely simple. Path. It's awesome. Yeah. You know, it really is just really a pretty simple command with some flexibility, yeah. too, if you want to use it. Also, we yep. probably should give honorable mention to NFS, right? Right, and if you're doing you know, Linux to Linux or Unix to Unix in any way, then NFS is a good option. Uh, but we thought we'd cover Samba because it works. Uh, if, if you have Linux and Windows servers uh, or machines, then Samba works better on Linux than NFS works on Windows. Yeah, uh, and Samba, you know, the, uh, the t we've actually interviewed some of the developers on Samba on the Linux Action Show, and they told us on the show that the way Samba was developed, that if a Samba client connects to a Samba Linux server, they know they're talking Samba to Samba, and mm -hmm. they communicate more effectively than you would if you're talking to a Windows machine. Right. So, so it's, they've even, built in hooks to make Linux communication efficient. So it's not just right. a Windows file sharing. It's got right. Because yeah, there. if you go, if you go, if you're doing Windows copying with uh, Samba, there's like a speed limit due to some inefficiencies in the protocol. But when you're doing Linux to Linux, Samba actually realizes this and makes it go faster anyway. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> so it could do stuff that you know uh, the Windows client can't. Right. And we probably maybe just if you want dead simple folks, if you want super easy file sharing. Here's where you can go. It's Dropbox. Now, we both, Alan and I, have some issues with Dropbox. Uh, right. Don't put anything secret or secure or no. important in there. No. But if you just want to drop a file to a couple of people, it's so if you, easy. If you have like an MP3 directory, like it's a gig or two, and you just want it on all your machines, it, you know, it's, it's a really easy way to do it. Also, if it's just simple documents, like you want to be able to edit a document between your Linux install and your Windows install, I, sometimes you just put Dropbox on both installations, and if there's small stuff, have it sync between the two that way. So Dropbox yep. is good, but I think maybe if you're a Linux person, you might want to check out SparkleShare. SparkleShare is sort of like Dropbox without all of the features exactly, but it lets you run your own sync cloud server, and it does all of the syncing over SSH. So you know right. between the machines is nice and secure. You can host your own Sparkle server at home. So, so you, you know, know that's secure. Yeah. Right? You don't so have that's to worry a great about way. With Dropbox, you have to worry about, you know, what are they doing with my files? Right. Especially but, with your example, the MP3 directory. It's like, you know, if those MP3s aren't exactly legal because of the yeah. deduplication <laughs> thing, if the music company comes to them with a fingerprint of a certain file right. and says, give us a list of all the people that have this file, right. they will do that. And Dropbox, so Dropbox has, has that index. Has, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so with SparkleShare, you can do your own. And mm -hmm. I know to a lot of people that appeals to them. Yeah, absolutely. And you, even if you, and you could just keep it on your LAN. If you just knew you just needed yeah. a lot of sharing between machines between on your LAN. Between a bunch network. of machines on your LAN, yeah. And, you know, it works on the internet, although if you have a slower internet connection, you lose some of the advantage. Unless you put up, like, on a hosted box, like a GoDaddy yeah. hosted server. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but I wanted to mention, now let's talk about LAN sharing, that this next one I'm going to talk about also lets you do net internet sharing if you wanted to, but you know how I'm saying it like that means you probably shouldn't. Yeah. It's called Megia? Megia? M-E-I-G-A. And it is crazy simple file sharing for Linux. A lot of distros just have it in their repo. I'm going to give you a quick demo of it right now, right here on Ooh. the Linux Action Show, because it's that easy. So I just apt get installed Magia here on uh, Ubuntu, or I did it on Linux Mint, but you could, it's the you know, same thing. 
And, and and this is stupid easy, Alan. Watch this. So I hit the plus button in their very simple UI, and I give it where I want to share out. Let's say I want to share out my videos directory, right? And I'll just share yep. out as videos. I hit OK, and if I don't configure anything else, that is now a web accessible URL that I can give out to people on my LAN. So if I type in 10.2.15 slash, and it's on it's on a special special port 8001, and I type in 8001 slash videos, and I hit enter. There's the list. It's just a quick directory listing of the videos. Now, what I love about this yep. is you could throw this up on your machine, and then you could just email someone a link to a file on your machine. Because, you know, when you do, yep. like, a Samba path or an NFS path, you can't really send them a clickable URL. They could go pull it off your machine. But with this, you can do that. And, of course, if they have a newer browser, you can just, like, play videos right here in your browser. And, it, you know, yep. it's a great way to just play bra videos off your machine on the go. Yeah, especially if you have, like, a, a web-enabled... Uh box of some kind they can have an interface exactly because you always want to have access to those really important videos whenever you need yep. them <laughs> okay it's a little uh, easter egg for the video viewers uh but uh, so that's uh magia and of course you could do anything yeah, it doesn't have to be videos again that that brings us back to uh what we talked about uh, on text the one time about having a dns server in your lan so that you can have a name instead of the ip address for that right yeah totally um now so that's Magia, and a name addressable would be a lot easier. And if you were at like a corporate LAN, you wouldn't probably, yeah, you probably would have a DNS server, like Alan's saying. Exactly. Um, but let's talk about SWAT. You yes. know about SWAT, Alan? You know you heard about SWAT yes. before? That's the uh, the administration tool for uh, yeah Samba. Samba Web Administration Tool. Now Samba mm -hmm. lets you run a file share that shows up on a Linux box. It'll show up to a Mac, and it'll show up to a Windows machine. And you know, like on Windows, you can go browse network neighborhood, and you see those machines show up. Well, now your Linux box will show up under there. Yeah. SWAT lets you have a web UI to set up Samba. Now, Samba, mm -hmm. I'll be honest, I'll tell you guys like it is, Samba is easy enough, and every distro comes with a well-commented smb.comp file. An that example, yeah. I would, I would kind of recommend you go that route. Samba is yes. really what I cut my teeth on on learning how to use config files. When I came to Linux as a server guy, I needed my immediate need was to replace a Windows file server. So mm -hmm. I dove right into Samba, and I believe... The, the logical layout of the way the, Samba, w way the Samba project has laid out all the configs in there, the documentation, yep. all make it work. But if you want a good, clean config with recommended settings, check out SWAT. Now, it's a little tricky mm -hmm. to get running because you have to have something called the Super Demon on a lot of your machines, uh, XNFD. Uh, mm -hmm. But I have links in the uh, show notes on how to set that up and how to get it going. Yeah. But it lets you configure things like the work group name. So I could say my work group here is called HomeNet. So I can go ahead and say that. And I'm going to call this... Uh, I'll call my server the Mint File Server. Okay, Mint File Server. And uh, I could put other things in here, like the server string that'll show up. Uh, user security is good. That's probably what you want to use. That means you're going to need to use SMB password on the command line to enable your users. But now when I yep. just hit Commit Change right here, click. Uh, and also I can go over here and I over to my shares and I can define shares. I, I went ahead and already defi uh, defined uh, yep. all of its share. And, and it gives you the, uh, the password thing, so you don't have to use the command line to set the users and right, passwords. Right, exactly. Now, if I go, uh, let's go take a look at my smb.com file. If I go cat that, uh, the smb.com file, which is an Etsy SMB, I think, right? Samba. I can't remember now. It's been so many years. Yeah, Samba slash smb.com. If you go cat that, you'll see now that what's in this config file is specifically what I set up in SWAT. You'll notice here that it has server string is Linux Mint. It has in here my, my all of it share that I set up. Everything, it just auto outputs all of this to a smb.com file. And the reason why that's mm -hmm. really nice is you can use SWAT to get you started to kind of figure out uh, what a good config file should look like. But, you know, if, if you're looking at this, any, most people recognize that as kind of the old INI uh, oh, file yeah, format. Oh, yeah, totally, totally. Right? And SWAT, SWAT will do it like safe, right? SWAT will set yeah. it all up for you in a safe format that you know works, and then you can go from there. Yeah. and so. It's basic. It's quite simple, right? You have uh, headers in square brackets, and then just key value pairs, with a setting equals, and then the value. Another handy Samba command, if you're learning Samba and you want to see what's going on, is there's a command called test parm. And yes. test parm. Now we're getting a little command line here, but this is really easy stuff. Test parm gives you an output of everything your SMB server is doing and how yep. it interprets your config file. So like, yeah, if you set it does something, a testing of the uh, the parameters. Yeah, test it, parm. Yeah, it, it basically tests your config file and that puts what it interprets that config file as meaning. Yep. And it's very handy to, to see what it's, it thinks of your config file. Especially when you're getting a result that you sh think should be one way, like 
you're trying to write to a directory and you keep getting access denied and you think it's right and you think it's right in the comp file, but you're not sure you got the syntax right, test parm will validate it for you. Yep. And there's even, a, there's even an option in test parm to throw out a flag to show all of the default options because all yes. of those F smb.conf options also can be set at compile time to what their default should be if you don't specify yep. it. And test parm will show you all of those defaults as compiled at compile time. Right. So, so you, if, <laughs> if you're just, you know, you're just looking for options to change, you can go through and look at every default and decide if that's the default you want or not. But SWAT is nice. I mean, it, yes. And the it, thing it about SWAT makes is it, it will easier. nuke your config file. So if you have stuff in there like comments and stuff, SWAT will wipe them out. So be prepared yeah. for that. But it is a great way to get started with, SM, with Samba. I call it SMB for, for sure. sure. Um, but you know what? I, I was pretty impressed with Magia. I, I was uh, pretty happy yeah. that little find, and it's a really simple little UI, and mm -hmm. I really like that you can, uh, you know, if you're an office that heavily uses email, you can, right. you can but change it's, that. It's mostly read-only, right? Uh, you have options, so let, why don't we chat about that for a second. So you can okay. do things like you can set a username and password, you can set the port number, you can do encryption, you can even, and I don't know the exact uh, workflow behind it, but you can utilize SSH to some degree. Right. Oh, and it also supports UNP Universal Plug and Play to update your router for port forwarding. <laughs> so isn't that just nice and automatic for you? Yeah. But it, you know, so once you have it set, you just you just you can go in there and configure those options, and then uh, you just can al also remove here. But yeah, you're right, Alan. It, as far as the end user interface, it's just a web interface. They can only pull right. files down, but you can password protect it if you want it. They right. can't and, submit to it. Right. And so that's the advantage with Samba is that you know if they open up the file directly from the share. They can edit it, save it, and it's saved on the server. And then, you know, another person can open it, and it's, they see the updated version. And, of course, probably worth mentioning, depending on your distro of choice, and the reason why I didn't slide it in here at the top of this little segment, most file managers, specifically, I know Nautilus does this, under Ubuntu and Mint and a lot of distros, when you're browsing a folder, you can just right-click on that folder. So, like, check this out. I'm in my home folder here. If I just right-click on, uh, say, my music folder, I can go down here to sharing options and I just click a few buttons and it is now shared out using Samba. And uh, of course, if you didn't have Samba installed, most of the time your distro will prompt you to install the package and then install right. Samba. Um, and it makes it almost as easy as doing it on Windows. Or it, actually, that is just as easy. That is that. just as easy, but it doesn't give you very many options. Oh, under right. SWAT, you can do some cool stuff. You can hide right. files from certain people. You can, you can say this directory can only be accessed by these three users. You can set it up so that if somebody deletes files in, from a Samba share, the server will delete it from the share, but secretly move it to, an, to a, like a temporary holding spot where then you can go clear it out as administrator. Yep. Oh my gosh, is that useful when you have a file server with users who delete files all the time? Yep. They call me up because you know what? Going to the backups constantly is a freaking pain in the ass. Yes. Especially the backup system we had back then. So when they'd call me up, and they'd be like, oh, I deleted a file, I'm an idiot. Be like, oh, okay, it's going to take me a while to uh, restore that. Just hold on. Copy CP, put it back in their location, you know, chamot it back to their rights. Be like, okay, it's all fixed for you now, and I'm done. Instead of having to yeah. go get the tape and do a restore and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. And SWAT will expose all that to you. SWAT also throughout it has help files that tell you what you're doing and what these mm -hmm. settings mean. Which is really nice. So if you are digging but through here and you don't... If, if you want to actually use the config file, uh, Samba's documentation is very good and includes very a good. bunch of examples. Yeah. Yeah. They have a bunch of different examples. Whether, you know, they have examples for, you know, you have two servers or two little machines set up at your house and you want to do this. And examples like you have a giant corporation with 50 servers yeah. and, and, and you want yeah. to do printer sharing and all this other stuff. Yeah. So yeah. They, they kind of give you all the examples you could need and very good documentation. One of the best things I did in my career was I... I did Samba the hard way. I went into the documentation. I mm -hmm. even went to the mm -hmm. compile routes when I was a Gentoo user, and I really dug into it. SWAT was a stepping tool for me to really dig into it, so I, I, yeah. I, that's why I'm offering it to you guys. But it's one of those that's worth digging into, and it's so powerful and so awesome. And it makes file sharing so easy. Once you learn it, you can bang out an smb.comp file in five minutes flat. No problem. For sure. From scratch. Yep. It's real easy. So there you go. Yeah. And, and that's why when I taught courses on server administration we would you know we started them out with swat but then we'd wean them back to the to the config file yeah and yeah. it's like all right you know you can see how easy this is you don't need the web tool exactly remember how hard it was to set up the web tool yeah it's actually exactly it's, it's, all, it's more work to set up your x inet d and everything than it yeah. is to just do the config by hand yeah but links to how to do that will be in the show notes yeah and uh, i'd like to hear what you guys think so leave us a comment wherever you're watching this or head to jupiter colony and Share your thoughts in there. And if you have any other cool tools to share files back and forth on Linux, let me know. Because there was a few that I used back in the day that are gone now. I was kind of bummed yep. by that. So maybe some of you have discovered new ones and 
leave us a comment somewhere and let us know what you think. All right, Alan, that's the Linux Action Show's look at simple file sharing on Linux. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Alan, great show, sir. Thank you for joining yes. me. Hey, we probably should give people a quick mention, a reminder about that poll in the show notes. Do you think the Linux Action Show should drop the season convention? Right now, the live stream is voting no, with 44% saying don't change it, and 43% saying do change it, with 13% clocking in with flip a coin. <laughs> <laughs> I just threw that one in there randomly. I gotta yeah. say, right now, I'm not leaning toward changing it, but... Uh, I'll let no. the audience out there have their voice heard, so go vote on that. And then also, a quick reminder, we won't be live next Sunday. We'll be live Thursday following TechSnap. You can always check out jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar, where we try to keep all of the updates on when shows are filming and when shows mm -hmm. are releasing and live events and stuff like that. So if you want to do that, there's an RSS feed, as well as a time zone converter. Yes. It's always very important. Alan, is there anything else we think we should touch on? Uh, maybe, maybe a little pre-announcement. Hopefully, unless uh, I get too busy and don't get a chance to, by next week's episode, we'll have a last subreddit set up. Yeah. We want to start getting uh, input on what you guys want to see so you can vote on stuff. So we're going to like have people submit distro reviews they want to see, news stories, uh, questions, and then we're going to have the last audience vote on them. And the ones that work, just like we do for TechSnap, the ones that work their way up to the top yeah. will feature in the show. So, you know, if you want to see something change in the show, or if you want to see something happen in the show, or something talked about in the show, that's going to be a great platform because then we'll be able to gauge how many other people want to see that too. Yep. And then we're not just sitting here like picking numbers out of our butt when we make guesses on what to talk about. Yep. That'd be a cool way to go. So hopefully we'll have more information about that in next week's episode of the Linux Action Show. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, and we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs> <laughs>